Good morning. Bienvenue, McMichael. I'm Victoria Dickinson, the Executive Director, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this morning to spend some time with one of Canada's iconic artists, Edward Bertinsky. I'd like to thank you all for coming and to acknowledge many of our trustees who are also with us this morning. The McMichael is delighted to have had the opportunity to work with Ed and his excellent staff to develop the exhibition you've seen today. Edward Bertinsky, The Landscape That We Change, is comprised of a selection of 30 photographic images from several series for which he is so well known, including rail cuts, homesteads, tailings, and oil. These photographs present disrupted landscapes, those created by the technology used in extraction of minerals and energy from the planet, and those changed by the extensive delivery systems that move these materials to produce goods. The relationship between art and nature is one of the cornerstones of McMichael, and I'd like to thank Ed not only for giving us the opportunity to present his stunning images, but also for his donation of these works to enrich the gallery's collection of important Canadian art. Thank you very much. I'd also like to thank the exhibition's curator, Chris Finn, who's sitting here at the front, whose thoughtful juxtaposition of Ansel Adams with Ed's work has made these two exhibitions a must-see in Toronto this summer. I'd also like to thank the McMichael staff, and especially Katerina Atanasova, our chief curator, and her dedicated team, as well as the marketing and communications staff for their highly visible promotions, and Anna Stanish and the program step group for organizing today's event. This fall, we're looking forward to seeing yet another project created by Edward Bertinsky. His extraordinary film, Watermark, will premiere at TIFF and then open in late September in theaters throughout the city. Please join me now in welcoming Ed Bertinsky. Thank you, Victoria. And again, I'd like to thank uh, Chris uh, Finn for all his hard work on curating the show, and it looks great. Uh, and it's great to be back at McMichael. I showed here, I think, over 25 years ago, one of my first early landscape shows with uh, seven other landscape photographers. So it's nice to be back, and it's nice to have been able to contribute to, to, the, to the important work that McMichael is doing. Um, I'm going to try and spend a bit of time giving you a bit of a um, idea or an idea of how I came to this work and, and why um, uh, I chose to go in the directions that I, uh, that I went in. And then uh, I want to spend a good part of this uh, showing you the latest work on Watermark. I've only showed this, I think, once or twice before. So um, you'll be seeing uh, what's going to be on, on exhibit in Toronto. Uh, at the Nicholas Mativier Gallery, and also there's a large gallery at 80 Spadina where I have my business Toronto Image Works, but we have a space on the fourth floor where we're showing some of the larger pieces, which I'm now starting to print in 60 inches by 80 inches, so we have a, quite a few large ones on display there. Uh, and uh, um, as Victoria said, there's a, a movie uh, that's coming out as well. I'm going to show um, a video clip or a small little 10 minute uh, making of the, the movie and the water project at the end of my uh, talk on water and after the end of, end of the uh, showing you of the images. So without further ado, I'll start with the work. So the, you've, you've seen in this uh, gallery that, that uh, uh, Chris and, and staff have chosen some of the early landscape works. And, um, this work, I think, was really important uh, for me to do. Uh, I was born in Canada. Uh, I have a deep appreciation for uh, the landscape that, that exists out there. That uh, I, Only after traveling a lot, it occurred to me that if I was born, let's say, in Holland and never left, um, and that was my idea of, of uh, nature and landscape, I would only know nature really through uh, pictures of, uh, you know, because everything there has been, you know, like over half the country has been reclaimed from the, uh, the seabed, but everything there has been divided up, manicured, and intentional. 
Uh, nature isn't manicured and intentional. It's it's messy and it's and it's disorganized and it uh, has its own patterns and its own rhythms. And to canoe up through there as a young young man and, and as a boy and to experience that landscape is to really understand what the reference point of nature is. And we as Canadians, you know, possess, you know, short of the Russians, but we as Canadians possess some of the greatest tracts of untouched land uh, of any country in the world today. So to me, somehow trying to go in and look at that landscape to understand what it is before we enter was key to the idea of, uh, of where I ended up going. So in this type of landscape, what I was looking for is not to do the kind of Ansel Adams sort of speaks a celebration. Uh, it was done, there was Edward Weston, uh, I, I learned about them in school, but I entered the whole idea of landscape shooting color and trying to, how should I say, uh, compress that space. I was kind of referencing abstract expressionism and, and Jackson Pollock and, and thinking about that and then working with large format cameras. So it's a, it's a camera that slows you down, same as Ansel Adams. You put a hood over your head, you're looking at the image upside down, you're committing to, you know, at that time and even today, to very expensive materials. So you, you wait for the light, you wait for the moment, you, you're, you're, you're fastidious about all the things. So it, you become a kind of, a, it was a ritual, that large format. And, and I really liked that ritual. I really liked the kind of thinking and the kind of arriving to the frame, to the photograph, to that essential element within that confused and chaotic landscape and so, hi, just hiving out that one section that all of a sudden makes sense. So to me, that was kind of my um, l learning the scales of what I needed to know, both to understand the landscape and to also understand how to work with high, qu high quality color materials, with color itself. Um, when I was doing those landscapes, there were literally, you know, almost no one was doing color large format landscape. The people who were doing it were doing it in black and white, but not in color. But after a few years of doing that, I recognized that um, there was something missing. I, I was, I was you know, shooting and shooting that work and I kept thinking that, you know, can I ever make images of that landscape that somehow resonate or, or, or that are true to my time? And, and as much as I love doing those landscapes and I spent five years on and off doing them, uh, I realized that some, I had to go to the next place. And the next place is how we, as humans, intersect into that landscape. And part of that came out of my own background. I worked in St. Catharines in the GM plant. I worked in Oakville in the Ford plants. And then I worked in the mines up in, uh, by Red Lake. So I saw open pit uh, uh, iron ore mines. I saw underground copper, um, gold mines. So I'd seen the mining industry. I'd seen large scale industry. And I started shooting it. I started shooting mines and I started thinking about that. And then in 1983, I did my first kind of series that, that started bringing me attention, which is the, the Railcut series. So this is a very early, and to me, rather than look at the Railcut series, rather than look at that landscape and the rail series that was done by the turn of the century or the early photographers, where it was more heroic and they were looking at the steam train going through the windy valley with snow-capped mountains, a very classic kind of, uh, of point of view. I went at it looking at frontally, just straight on as a way of contemplating what that engineered line through that landscape meant. And then also trying to make one co contemplate what, does, what do those cars mean? What is that, you know, what, the, the taking of resources that, that, you know, Europeans came, you know, to this country and largely plundered it and, and built a rail across. And the main reason for the rail was to bring these valuable goods, uh, the, the furs and the trees and the, uh, and the minerals back to the east and a lot of it back to Europe as well. So that line to me represented this incursion, this how we shape that landscape. So I did a whole series on, on, on the rail cut. So that ended up being about a series of 20 of them. Um, at the same time, I was also doing mines, uh, and what what I and that again is the material the material that was being you know taken from that landscape, and it occurred to me that you know if we look, if I look back a couple hundred years, like at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and, and we, you know, looked at artists that were working, the romantics that were working with the idea of sublime, for instance, like Caspar David Friedrich uh, or, or Turner. And their idea was that you know, nature was the omnipresent force, the fearful force that dwarfed us in its presence. So a gale force 
uh, you know, storm on the uh, on the ocean swallowing ships was like a a, a, te a, 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 a theme that Turner liked to work with, um, and. And that was the notion of the sublime at that time, that we were, you know, uh, that we were dwarfed by nature, that nature was the force. And now, the, the Industrial Revolution, 200 plus years later, <clears throat> we built ships that, that don't break up at sea. We have jets that fly over these weather systems and then and are air conditioned. We have cars that keep us, you know, cool when it's hot outside or uh, warm when it's cold outside or in the houses doing the same thing. But in that isolation of ourselves from nature and the forces of nature, uh, and also through the internal combustion engine, seeing how, um, you know, we've expanded our populations uh, through the oil and, and the abundant energy that it provides, we are now the force of nature, that we are now the, the sublime force, the, uh, the elemental force that is shifting uh, nature and it's shifting the planet. So again, we're doing these as large format prints, these are the two of the largest mines in the world. The first one was in Bingham Valley and this one is in northern Chile in the, in, uh, the Atacama Desert. 25,000 um, employees that were working there, they were producing at one point at the peak of this mine was producing 30% of the world's copper. And so here northern, the driest place on the planet, northern Chile, I'm taking this photograph and, and, I, and I, it occurs to me that, <clears throat> that we all, we're all connected to this mine on some day. Every day I'm sure we interact with something coming out of the, the copper coming out of this mine, whether it's in our phones or in our cars or in our windings of our motors, somehow we touch the, the, the product out of this mine. So these are the collective landscapes, the, the ones that we all participate in on a daily basis, but yet we're disconnected from. And then I looked also that every mine has uh, a, a consequence. Every mine has tailings. They can't use all the material. There's a lot of rock that has to be put somewhere. So this is in, 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 um, in Sudbury at Inco Tailings. So I did a whole series on tailings as well and, and as, as, as a consequence of mining. Uh, I also then went from the idea of, okay, I'm going to photograph mines. I spent years doing that and then I thought, well, what else can I photograph? What, where else can I go with showing large-scale uh, interventions in the landscape? And it occurred to me that quarries would present an opportunity. Quarries is where we go in and take uh, stone dimensionally by the block and leaving these voids. So I did a whole series over about three years of quarries, both in, in uh, um, United States, some in Canada as well, and then I went to, to um, uh, Italy to the Canetta quarries. And then after that I went to five other countries photographing quarries uh, and then did a book on quarries after about a 17 year investigation of the subject. But again, it, it presented these you know, phenomenal opportunities to look at this collective uh, taking that we have done over, over the centuries and, uh, and then finding, finding those voids and then being able to record those voids in ways that kind of bring us, reconnect us with these landscapes. That we're, uh, we live in our busy lives, most of us are like in Canada, 85% of us live in urban centers, only 15% live outside in rural uh, Canada. And so we're largely urban, we're a largely urban, urban culture. And we don't see, we, don't, we, we, we know we're a natural resource economy, we know that's where 50% of the Toronto Stock Exchange is earning their money and where a lot of the you know, government funding and the federal government is coming from that resource industry, but we don't see it. We don't, we don't often engage with the landscape, with that landscape of where we take, where we go in. And to me, that was the landscape that, that interested me. And, and these are some of the latest, late, the, the, at the very end of my 17 year uh, exploration what occurred to me, what I wanted to show at one point was something that was equivalent to the skyscrapers uh, in Toronto when I first saw them when I was 17, you know, looking at the IMP, CIBC building, and I thought there must be something in nature of the equal scale but an inversion of that. And in many ways this photograph kind of was the representation of that inverted architecture that, that is a direct consequence of, of, of our taking. I then went to China. And when I first thought about China, it was like, 
it, it was a crazy idea, like how do you wrap your head around China? But I started with the Three Gorges Dam. I wanted to photograph a large dam, and this was the largest dam ever built, and I think it will be the largest dam ever built by man. Um, and it, it had 34 turbines. These turbines are almost uh, equal, each turbine is almost equal to a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power station's about 1,000 megawatts. These were 700 megawatts per turbine. 34 of them were put in. Um, and uh, they're currently uh, the mining project, uh, the, um, the dam that I'm photographing the last few years in China. Uh, they're at 820 megawatts per, per turbine. So these are massive turbines. Um, and <clears throat> the building of that dam represented um, the equivalent of about 20 nuclear power stations to, in terms of the amount of power it was providing. Uh, totally re reshaped uh, the whole Yangtze River area, the climate had changed, and now they're f seeing all the problems that are occurring as a result of that dam and, and, and much of what was being said and much of the warning signs that were being you know, it's told to the government back then about what's going to happen to the water quality and to, to the ecosystem have all come true. Uh, I also wanted to put a face on manufacturing in China. We all know, know that manufacturing went to China. It's the, man, it's the manufacturer for the world, but there wasn't any, um, you know, evidence of it through photography. So I was one of the first ones to, I think, uh, go to China and begin to show the scale of, of the newly uh, minted industrial revolution in China. So if you've seen the world, uh, the movie Manufactured Landscapes, um, I think this is, where is it? yeah, so Manufactured Landscapes, the opening shot, that eight minute shot was a dolly shot along this whole factory which makes coffee makers. Um, and um, it had 20,000 employees and that was a kilometer long. So it was a, 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 an eight minute opening shot in the movie which uh, um, uh, people have often said is one of the most intriguing openings to any film because it has to slow you down. No fast cutting here, just like row after row after row of, of, of assembling of coffee makers. This is a chicken packing plant in, in China. Um, <clears throat> and then I went to look at oil uh, as, a, as a subject. And again, it, it was a big, a big idea, like how do you begin to encompass oil? Everything that we touch today is somehow been touched by oil, whether through transport, whether it's our clothing that has oil in it, through synthetics or whatever. It's almost like I couldn't, I had this, I called it my oil epiphany in 1997. I was photographing the tailings series and I pulled out onto fresh blacktop going up um, past Perry Sound. I was heading up to, to and, and I was looking at my, I was a Volvo and I was looking at my steering wheel and it was plastic and I was looking at, you know, all my dash was plastic. I was looking at the blacktop and I just finished putting oil and, and gas in my car and I'm saying everything I'm touching is oil yet I have no idea of the landscape from where it comes. In the same way, I, I didn't really understand where copper came from or iron ore came from. So, so I wanted to start doing a series of images that take me to those landscapes, takes me back to those places where our oil comes from. And uh, I ended up going into um, where oil was first discovered. This is in the Kern Valley oil field around Kern Valley where if you saw the movie, uh, There Will Be Blood, um, uh, that with Daniel Day-Lewis, it was that discovery and it's still being uh, pumped for oil a hundred years later. So I went to the early discovery of oil, I started to look at the landscape of oil, this is like the franchise, um, you know, alley, this is in Pennsylvania near the, near the uh, turnpike, Pennsylvania turnpike, uh, and just wanting to show the kind of drive-through culture and, the, and the, the culture that the automobile had uh, brought forward. I also the idea of the end of oil, that all things uh, come to an end. There's some photographs here as well from uh, scrapyards. And so it's that kind of, um, you know, the, things that, the thing that humans produce more than anything else in the world is waste. And that waste stream comes from the automobile, tons of it, tires and, and engines and radiators and, you know, bodies and, you know, everything, everything in the car, each car, you know, from the moment you take a car off the lot, 
to the moment of the, the day it's, it's retired, every day it, that entropy, that slow wearing down to the point where 15 years, 16 years later, that car no longer has value, but it goes somewhere. I also went to look at uh, oil fields that have been abandoned. This is in, in Baku. So, and then, you know, uh, air, 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 these are big jets that were abandoned, these are transport jets in the US military, uh, the recycling of, of jets. Oil, oil drums being recycled, the tire piles that created a kind of a, an immense landscape on their own. This was a tire pile that had uh, at its peak 40 million tires and then when I got there there was about 25 million and then three months after I photographed it, it was hit by lightning and, and burned for uh, two years. So these are oil tankers, again the end of oil, the oil tankers where they go to die. Um, and um, again, trying to show in Bangladesh, this is where oil tankers are taken down. And uh, it was the quarry series that got me shooting in Italy, and it occurred to me that I can go somewhere where I don't speak the language, I can find assistance, I can navigate these different countries uh, through assistance. And so I, I began to open up further and further into the world to the point where my work became very global. So I've worked in India and China and, and a variety of other places. So now I'm onto the water series. So the first series I thought is where did we, where did we create landscapes that something went wrong? And so, you know, this was the uh, Gulf oil spill, the BP oil spill. Uh, and it was a place where these two themes I've been working on for a long time, oil and water, kind of merged in the same surface. So this was the dr this was a drilling rig that actually did drill uh, the hole, uh, the Makanda hole that went bad, uh, and now it's currently drilling to try and build drill the relief well. This is about um, four weeks into the disaster, uh, and to me it was kind of that same. Uh, it's a kind of like the Mary Shelley Frankenstein story where. Um, you know, you create some, something new, go, go to a, a, not understanding the risk and all of a sudden the monster gets out of the lab and, and trying to re contain, contain the monster. Well, again, here, here's a case where we, it's almost like the Titanic, we, a, a technological marvel, we can now drill at 23,000 feet, but all of a sudden, you know, we lost control of the, of the well and now it's spewing, you know, 60,000, you know, barrels a day. So. Um, so to me that was, uh, again, a, a, um, a classic human kind of overreach where we go into a situation thinking that everything's going to be fine and only finding out later that, you know, human error can, can and really cause massive, massive consequences. So this is all around the Delta and it also the Mississippi Delta, this is around New Orleans. And if you look, this is a, almost like a distressed landscape on a distressed landscape. So this is, the, the green is also from phosphor and nitrates coming out from the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. And the Gulf actually, there's about a 100 kilometer radius around the uh, exiting of the water of the Mississippi where uh, it's a dead zone that the, all, all the oxygen has been depleted from the algae blooms that are caused by all that nutrition coming off of the farmer's fields down through the Mississippi and exiting out into, into the Gulf of Mexico. So, so that was already a problematic situation for wildlife and fish uh, and then added to that uh, the oil spill on top of that. This is Owens Lake Bed where the water was diverted for, uh, for Los Angeles uh, and that was done by Mo Holman in around 1910. And this is the remediation of that lake bed so they're actually, it's a billion dollar irrigation project to keep the dust down on that bed. Uh, this is Salton Sea which is another man-made disaster where uh, uh, 1905 a dam broke on the, on the Colorado River and re-diverted the whole Colorado River into the Salton Basin. Uh, and, it, and it just flowed for four years, creating what was the largest now, the largest body of water um, in California, the Salton Sea. Uh, now that sea, again, it's a lot, of a lot of nutrients from the Imperial Valley have gone in, so that green is not a healthy color. It means there's a lot of algae in the water, and the salinity of, the, of that water is now uh, way above the, the, the oceans. It's about two or three times what the oceans are, and all the fish, as a result, have, have, have pretty much died except for I think there's one, there's one fish that still could, tilapia can still survive in that water. <coughs> um, 
so, so because they now the, the Colorado River does not make it to the uh, ocean, hasn't made it to the Gulf of Mexico now for over 40 years, and a lot of people don't know that, but the Colorado is totally diverted to create places like Vegas, uh, um, Phoenix, Scottsdale, all of these are, you know, and the Imperial Valley is, is all a result of, of the um, of the water from the Colorado. So now that delta, which was a thousand square, square kilometers of, of delta, is now a desert. And what's happened, this is the silt, remaining silt in that delta. And what happens here is as the, as the pumping action of the ocean tides come in and out, when the, when the tide retreats, it creates, the, you know, water will find its weakest points and it creates these uh, tree forms. So the whole delta is now uh, covered in these kinds of tree forms that, um, that are a, a result of, of the you know, silt and the, the, the pumping action of the tides. This is uh, just a small area where there is another river that comes into the delta region and there is still some life and some color in that as well, but it's almost like a primordial um, you know, kind of ooze of, of the beginnings of life. Uh, this was a shrimp farm that was abandoned in the Delta. This was, uh, um, they, they do grow shrimp brine and also uh, uh, salinas, they call them, where they, where they uh, evaporate the uh, ocean waters and then, and then harvest the, the uh, sea salt. This is a phosphor tailings pond in Florida. Phosphor being one of the um, you know, prime destroyers of watersheds. So if you get too much phosphor, which is a, basically fertilizer for farms, and if you, if, if you get a lot of runoff with high in phosphor coming into the water, uh, you'll get you know, what's happening in Lake Simcoe, Lake Winnipeg, even La uh, Lake Erie, you end up getting uh, a depletion of oxygen. It goes anabolic and then, and then um, it, it uh, kills off the water. So these fertilizers often end up in, um, in the watershed and are very damaging. And, once, and, and often the, <clears throat> what, what would happen is all of the wetlands would absorb and all the greenery in the wetlands would absorb that phosphor and eat it and, and, you know, and, and it would kind of cleanse that out of, the, out of the water. But we've also taken out most of the wetlands. So a lot of wetlands have been drained for farmland. Uh, on the west coast uh, United States, I think only 10% um, of, of wetlands remain of what was there uh, 100 years ago. Uh, again, water remediation in a, in a um, uh, geothermal plant. Another Salinas. This was also a town in the Salton Sea. It was like once the, once the uh, environmental reports for, uh, uh, for the Salton Sea were starting to come out in the late 70s and early 80s, the town that was going to be 30,000 strong of homes, uh, they sold a bunch of them and then, and then nobody wants, wanted to buy. So this was a kind of a stillborn town, but people who bought are still living there. So this was a Salt, Salton City, it's called. And then I went to look at how you know, we uh, control water at scale, so I looked, this is the uh, All-American Aqueduct. This is the, the water that's diverted, the 4, acre, uh, 4 million acre feet diverted uh, uh, from the Colorado, the last diversion that goes to the Imperial Valley, which grows a phenomenal amount of food that I'm sure we partake of on a daily basis and salads and things like that in the winter. But uh, this, this is, uh, again, the diversion, large-scale diversion of water. Again, an image showing both before and after, like on the right, that's what you start with, a desert, and then you add water and you can get a fertile um, farmland. Uh, it's Phoenix, but up against the Navajo Reservation. Different attitudes towards the landscape. Uh, this is the lowest, this is um, uh, Shasta, uh, Shasta Re Lake, or the reservoir. Uh, there's less uh, snow cap and more demand on water, so this is the lowest it's been in, in its history as, as a reservoir. And that is the Los Angeles aqueduct kind of petering out. Uh, Holland, uh, this is where all reclaimed land from the sea, this is part of the way they do it through large sandbars and large interventions uh, at the ocean's edge. Uh, processing of human waste, this is the biggest uh, um, uh, sewage processing plant in, in London, England. 
another uh, sewage processing plant in the United States. And then I looked at also ancient controls of water. These were step wells uh, in northern Rajasthan where during the monsoons they would fill up and then throughout the year the towns would, would come and walk down the stairs as the water table went down and were able to get water throughout the year. So I did a series on these uh, crazy step wells, like these ziggurats, but they um, allowed for the taking of water. And now they're all gone bone dry because they're pumping uh, the water with uh, well pumps at about um, you know 50, 60 feet. They've gone below the step wells, so now they've all gone dry. <clears throat> this is 12th century. This is built in the 12th century, like literally inverted pyramids. Uh, then I looked at the largest dam in in China that's being built right now. This is a, a double arch dam. Uh, 14,000 kilowatts. Uh, just to give you a perspective, the Hoover Dam, which was the first large-scale arch dam that was constructed on scale, was 2.2 thousand megawatts, which is like a, a couple of nuclear reactors. This is 14,000, so this is six times the size of the Hoover Dam. And this dam also features in the film as well. We got some amazing footage uh, uh, on location here. And this is a silt release in, on the Yellow River. So that's the silt being actually released. So uh, it happens once a year. They, they blow out a lot of the silt. Agriculture, 70% of human use of water is towards agriculture. So I had to give it a prominent spot within the book and the project. So I did a whole series on, on agriculture, and particularly terraforming desert areas. Uh, this is uh, greenhouses in Spain. Uh, pivot irrigation in, um, in Texas. I did a whole series on pivot irrigation. You can basically see how they're doing it. So here, there's a pivot. There's water coming out there. So you can see it's evaporating. And now it's germinating. So they've planted the seed. These are a mile across. This here is, is, a, is a suburb. These are homes. Uh, and so these are about a mile across. So each one of these is about 650 acres. Um, and, um, and, and, and they're pumping out of the aquifer. So the Ogallala Aquifer is the largest uh, aquifer in North America. They estimate there's like nine Lake Eries of water uh, in the aquifer, uh, covering seven states, and they've now gone through about, they think, two Lake Eries of water, so the whole aquifer is dropping down. So I went in search of the green verdant uh, circle, and then this is uh, one that had to be abandoned well over 20 years ago. So I looked at areas that dry, dried up, and this is like the last remnants of a circle that had, was active at one point. And to me, that was the metaphor that I wanted to work towards, is this, that, that that's the destination, that's the fate of all of those circles is the fact that, there, that, that there's a finite amount of water in that aquifer, and it'd be like draining the Great Lakes. So eventually you drain it to the bottom, and you, or, or it doesn't become economically viable to, to, to pump it out because the cost of pumping it out is so expensive, and then, and then these things will begin to collapse, and they already are collapsing. <clears throat> but, um, you know, I've been using aerial photography, and now I've moved to digital. So a lot of this whole project is now shooting with digital, and it's allowing me to do things I could never do before. Like I'm shooting three or four frames from a whole of a Cessna, uh, and then stitching them together later on in Photoshop. So these are like this is an uh, eight-foot-high print, and um, but it's stitched together from about uh, uh, nine or ten around there, nine, I'd say. 60 megapixel files all stitched together. So these are ridiculously large files. But this is something that could never be done as a project uh, with analog film. So again, the new technology has allowed me to enter into this kind of work and, and consider these kinds of ideas that were uh, literally impossible to do five years ago. And this is um, a farming in Spain. So those are uh, um, uh, orchards, the olive, olive or orchards. These are all olive trees. Mm -hmm. uh, this, it's called dryland farming. It's a one crop a year farming uh, in central, in northern cent central Spain. <clears throat> uh, 
And this is basically foothills, and they're bas basically going into the valleys and farming the, 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 the um, plowable valleys within, within these uh, foothills. Uh, and it's been going on for quite some time. I found Spain a very rich place to photograph uh, agriculture because of the, the color palette in there. Uh, aquaculture is another large scale human in, uh, incursion or human use of water. So um, in most of, uh, most of my research ends up looking, if I'm going to do aquaculture, I'll say, well, where's the greatest concentration of aquaculture in the world? Well, China does the most. Out of, if you look at all the aquaculture, all the salmon farms and everything, and call that 100% of human activity, 70, full 70% of aquaculture is in China, and very little of it's exported. So here they're uh, farming abalone and, uh, and a, a couple of varieties of fish. One's called a cucumber fish. So there's 25,000 you know, of these kind of uh, uh, homes that are all stitched together with these little plots for, uh, for aqua farming. So uh, this was, uh, and, and in China, I'm going to show you a small video uh, of the making of this shot, but I've put my 60 megapixel Hasselblad on a remote helicopter uh, and I'm flying it remotely and, uh, and framing and shooting from 800 feet uh, from the ground. Uh, I looked at more sustainable uh, farming. This is um, in Yunnan province, and these are rice terraces that have been going for uh, close to 3,000 years and can continue to continue for thousands of years as well. So, um, so this represents uh, some, an activity that humans can engage with uh, for a long period of time and, and, and not deplete that, lands that landscape. These are Salinas in Spain. Again, where there's part aquaculture, part salt recovery from the oceans. And again, I, you know, I think that if you go back to the earlier landscape work, I'm still working with that all overness, with color, with, uh, you know, and now with the aerial work, I'm becoming more abstract as well. So I'm, I'm constantly working with, with the idea of color and abstraction. And, uh, but I think in the water project and being uh, uh, at that elevated perspective that the um, helicopter or the plane were able to offer me, uh, allowed me uh, a, 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 an opportunity to work with, with uh, landscape in, in a whole new way. These are uh, suburbs in, in Florida. Uh, Cape Coral, this is one of the largest uh, uh, false uh, waterfront uh, de developments in the world. So I was interested in that kind of reclaiming the mangroves into waterfront and, and the kind of desire, human desire to go to waterfront and to create communities onto waterfront that are, um, you know, not meant to be waterfront, but that they'll, the developer will get more money by offering a waterfront um, property. This is in Spain, looking at uh, recreation as a, as a drive for humans to go to that, and then also looked in India, the largest human gathering, the largest pilgrimage gathering for the spiritual quality and, and cleansing power of water. So there was um, 30 million um, the people who um, arrived on a single day uh, to, uh, to bathe in the Ganges. Uh, probably one of the most sacred places in all of India, in Varanasi, this is where the burning ghats. So this, again, the prints I'm working on here, like this is three frames stitched together in Photoshop, but blown up to eight foot wide, so the actual print is all, you know, bigger than what you're seeing on the screen right now in, 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 in the flesh. So they're quite remarkable. Uh, the detail of the digital quality is something that almost could not be rivaled by film anymore. Again, uh, reclaimed waterfront in Holland, a polders in Holland. Uh, Georgian Bay, I wanted to bring something of Canada into this project. So the Great Lakes represent 22% of the world's fresh water. If you look at the 2 million lakes beyond um, the Great Lakes, uh, that rep represents another 10% of the world's fresh water. So Canada is really a, a water nation. You know, we, we're, we're kind of becoming, unfortunately, known for oil, not great oil in the oil sands, but uh, water is really our great resource. And then I did, for the first time in a long time, just went and looked at the source. So this is where the hydrological cycle of water was taking place. So this is one of the last great unt untouched watersheds in the world, which is the northern BC, the Stikine. 
Um, <clears throat> so I wanted to kind of go, go and kind of tip my hat to that landscape, to that place where the hydrological cycle begins with the, you know, the fresh water that comes off the oceans, gets caught into the mountaintops, as it lands as snow, and then melts throughout the year and provides uh, fresh water downstream. So that's in Iceland. Again in Spain. Iceland again. A glacier, so much of our water comes from, from, from glaciers throughout the year. There's a lot of stored water there. The Stikine, the, if, uh, if you get a chance to see the film, the closing, uh, the closing shot is about a five minute shot of a chopper flying through the Stikine Canyon, which is Canada's kind of Grand Canyon. It's one of the most beautiful canyons uh, in Canada. It's in BC, northern BC. And then this is again in Iceland, um, glacial water coming down through the, through the landscape. Now if all works well, this should be a, a, a few minute piece on the making of the water project. When I first started doing altered landscapes, um, it was more of an exploration, going in my car, driving around North America, searching for things. I didn't know exactly where they were or what they looked like, so it was always this kind of adventure and discovery. And what's changed over the different themes uh, and over the years is now with the assistance of the web and being able to look at things in, in, in more depth before I go there, I can actually predetermine my pictures. So in the water project more than ever, when I was going to a location, I knew pretty close. I was very, you know, almost, you know, assured that the images that I would get uh, would be of that nature. So it was far more intentional now than it was in the past. Man. So this, so this is a, this would be an amazing, like three to four o'clock shot. Yeah, that would put it at right there. Same right there. Yeah. We have a, a, a deep human desire to be in the presence of water. So I try to find the imagery and the ideas that spoke to that. So it led me to the Kumbh Mela Festival, the largest pilgrimage of humans on the planet. Uh, but their, pil their pilgrimage is to water, is to, you know, the cleansing power of water, the spiritual need for the cleansing power of water. This looks private, no? The guy with the motorcycle bike? There's a little flat spot there. Well, can you ask those guys who lives here? I can do a big, and you can probably even do a pan across it like this. Yeah, yeah. This is pretty good. So I was allowing the subject matter to determine where to be. I, I work backwards from the subject matter to the point of view. And in this project, for the first time, completely released myself from gravity, that the point of view would be wherever it is. And that was interesting. So I, it was a very much a global approach to the idea of water with no restrictions as to where I can stand. And so the whole body of work <clears throat> grew with understanding that I was willing to position myself you know, short of going into outer space, but I can position myself, you know, within up to 10,000 feet from the subject. That was, a, for me, a very uh, interesting creative jump where I've always been held back in my previous projects through costs and through, um, you know, sheer logistics and, and film and what its possibilities are and operating a camera remotely. But with all the new technology, I can operate a camera a thousand feet away from me on a helicopter and bring it back and have images that I can blow up to 5, 60 by 80 and they're tack sharp. Chip is in. Yep. We're good to roll. Okay.
Looking good. What's that? Okay. So that was a kind of an evolution of subject matter, technology, and using um, all the tools, everything from remote helicopters to lifts to helicopters to fixed wing planes to a 50 foot pneumatic pole. All those things were all about where do I stand? Okay, so that is the second generation. Do we know how to work the radios? Yeah. Have we got a instruction? I think we're good for that. Okay. Let's get these guys okay, they're going. up in the air, Jim. Let's okay. Do a... If we do have to get out while the blades are turning, we'll want to go low, possibly in rolling. You want to be conscious to any potential terrain change because it does get you pretty close to the rotors. Questions? Good to go. Okay, let's do it. Let's go. I've absolutely liberated myself of where I get to stand. If I want to be anywhere, I will be there. I'll find a way to be there. So and it's, it's quite interesting when you kind of release yourself from gravity, so to speak, and, 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 and uh, find that you can make the point of view anywhere that you want it to be. It would look really great in the big size. This is the one that I would like to before copy that. Just run through them. Okay, so this one, Dion. That's this one. This Whatever is for Spain? This overlap, yes. This okay. is what's it called? What's the title of this one? Selection. This one is... It makes such a difference seeing the real thing. This looks very washed out. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh, this is nice too. So what stage are we at with this? It's, it's a, a work in progress, right? It is kind of longer. It's a desert region, but it's, uh, in the winter it gets enough rain. So they plant like late fall, November, and then they harvest in, in the spring. So this is a kind of a very ancient form of farming. One season in the winter, the rain it gets allows for one crop, that's it. This is a sustainable form of farming evolved over uh, multiple generations. It allows us to take what we need from the land without depleting it.
water is not optional. That to me, as a, as a liquid, it was the ultimate thing that provides for life. And if it's missing, uh, you know, humans have to leave that area if they don't have it. It's as simple as that. There you have it. So you're the first ones to see the making of piece, so it's the inaugural showing of it. But uh, I'd be happy to take any uh, questions about uh, the show here or the new work or just anything. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the new. I think uh, we're, we're, that was a, a pretty <clears throat> intense benchmark to try and beat. And um, but so far, people think that we've we've achieved that with the next film. So and in that film, it was uh, largely directed. It was directed by Jennifer, uh, but it was looking at all my work as the source material, as the authoring of of the subject. So it was basically taking. And the ideas that I developed in my stills and expanding the context through film to show you kind of where, you know, the worlds from which these landscapes were taken, uh, which film does that beautifully. And we've used that same kind of um, idea with this film with the shooting of the water project. So I'd already been shooting it for three years. And then Jennifer and I um, decided to co-direct. So I was doing a lot of the large overviews and all like in the helicopter that you saw uh, where we're, we had just come out of that hangar and we were sitting there if you saw that camera off the nose of the helicopter that's the Cineflex camera those are um, those cameras are worth like six hundred thousand dollars they're controlled from inside they're highly stabilized so if you see the film you'll see these incredible shots through like the Stikine Canyon or you'll see you know beautiful flyovers or a zoom from you know that just seems to go on forever uh, especially with uh, uh, the pool around Discovery Bay and that's all being done with uh, with a camera operator inside the, the helicopter and then I'm directing the frame, and he's doing, and, the, and so you're working with a pilot, the Cineflex operator, and then the director. So all three are actually creating the shot. Um, and so the pilot has the image that, that we're working on in his purview, so he can see it. It's mounted up where he's flying. And then, the, then I have one, so I can see the image, and then the Cineflex operator has one as well. So we're seeing exactly the same image. And so he, the, the, the helicopter operator, I'm saying to him, okay, slow down, go higher, you know, you know, do a curve around there, and then he's trying to follow, and you're, so you're telling him, go wider, go tighter, or things like that nature. So I was doing a lot of that kind of work, and Jennifer was trying to find the kind of human stories on the ground and getting interviews with people who have experienced the consequences of those landscapes uh, and the things that we have done and bringing those stories forward into the, in, in, into the, into the movie as well. So it's 10 countries and 20 stories that we've uh, uh, gone through for the water project. Yes? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, I, you know, it's interesting because I, I mean, it is a little scary when you see what's happening in the two most populous countries in the world, which is China and India, and as they're uh, trying to uh, evolve their economies to, you know, to, to mirror what, we're, what we've done and achieved in the West. And, um, you know, one of uh, William Reese in the, in, in the oil book, he writes an essay, but William Reese was the, the uh, author of the term ecological footprint. So he looked at, you know, how, you know, for every human being on the planet, how much land is needed per year to support a human life and what's the average, you know, around the world for, at that time it was like six billion or whatever. And the average from the hectares that are out there was 2.2 .2 hectares per person. 
was the average. But then he looked at lifestyles. He looked at our lifestyle uh, here in, in North America and Europe, and we were around nine hectares per person to support the level of, of uh, caloric intake that we have, just simply on calor caloric intake. And then he, you know, so obviously if there's, if we're eight or nine and the world average is 2.2, a lot of people are living under one hectare, which is all through, uh, um, you know, India and, and China and the developing world. So he, he, ma he makes the point, if we take, uh, and for every year, for the last 25 years, uh, we are losing farmland through desertification, through overgrazing or through overuse, uh, lack of water. So every year for 25 years, the, the actual amount of hectares has been getting smaller and smaller. But if you take that and you say, okay, if the rest of the world meets our eight hectares per person consumption, we're missing, we're short three planets. Uh, because you're, we're not going to come up with more farmland. Uh, it doesn't exist. So ultimately, the, the trajectory is, is an impossible one. There's no way the whole all seven billion going to nine can live the kind of lifestyle that we have. The, the planet doesn't have it to give. And now we can see that we're living in a finite planet so that the oceans, you know, who, who could imagine if you've flown over and kept your eyes open and looked out the window and, and crossed the Atlantic or the Pacific, it's hard to even imagine that we can fish that out. We're fishing it out. Um, so what was an, uh, thought unimaginable a century ago is actually occurring in front of our eyes. So, you know, I do believe we can move towards a sustainable, um, uh, you know, species. But I don't think we're taking it seriously enough, and I don't think we're going fast enough. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pessimistic about the timeline. I'm optimistic that we have the, the, the wherewithal and the ability to do it. I just don't think we're, um, we're you know, sounding uh, the uh, ten alarm fire that we should be sounding right now because <clears throat> the, you know, we're, we're quickly running into uh, our limits to, to resources, and, and it's going to start pushing back. If it, you know, we're already seeing climactic pushback, so so um, so I do, you know uh, there's a concern. I think everybody needs to uh, um, you know not be complacent about this in, in, in any way we can to, to to begin to remediate the kinds of issues that we're uh, we're facing. Yes. Uh, not filters. Um, in that case, uh, like a lot of the shipbuilding, the, the shipbreaking work in, in Bangladesh and that recycling work, and there's some here too, I would often find the film that I liked, because that was back in, before digital. So I was shooting with 8x10 negative film. So the particular, that, that particular shot was shot 8x10 negative um, with a film made by Agfa at the time. It was called Optima 100. And I liked it because of the way it responded in that scale, in that tonal scale of yellows and reds and oranges and things of that nature. So if I would have shot that same thing with Kodak film, it would just wouldn't have the same kind of presence. If you look at the, um, on, on the far wall here in the show, there's some recycling pictures of, of um, it's called bushling from the stampings from the auto industry. And that's using that same technique, 8 by 10 negative film from Agfa. So I would marry up the film with the subject because I felt this, that that film reacted into those colors in a certain way. With um, digital, it's different, so you can actually profile to whatever, they even have profiles saying if you like that look at that film, you can go back and, and, and there would be an applied profile of that film to your file to make it look like that. Um, but, um, you know, back in the days of analog, you, you, I, I was always testing materials, and that's, you know, I started Toronto ImageWorks in 1985 uh, as a way to supplement my career as an artist and a way to print my work, and I still have Toronto ImageWorks. It still has 30 employees in downtown Toronto. But I felt by doing that versus, you know, teaching or versus being a commercial photographer, it allowed me to, to purely work on my, my, my photography and not m mix it up with other 
ways of using the camera as a tool, which is, a, I did like architecture and I was doing some architecture work, but uh, largely stayed away from commercial work and commissioned work and just did my own. But the lab allowed me the ability to become a, uh, a printmaker. So all the prints you see here are made at my lab. Um, and you know, I spent you know, you know, 20, 20 years printing for other people, printing their uh, portfolios and my own as well. So I did get to understand the materials and test them out and, and try that film against that. So when I did the refinery project uh, back in, in the uh, mid-90s, I had every film type in 4x5 that was available and I went and shot that same, you know, two or three of frames of the exact same thing with all the different film types and then I processed all the film and then I tried different paper types and I printed all those different films on different paper types until I got the combination that I said I like this film with that paper and then, and then I, you know, and then I do that. So I wasn't, I wasn't true to one film type. I was trying to find the right film for the subject. So that's, so when you get that kind of presence in the print, it's a highly kind of evolved working through the materials to understand how they perform under different conditions of light and color. Yes? I'd say it's fairly true. The only thing that uh, I can do today, like if I had to do this project on water with film, uh, it, it would be uh, probably a big fail because um, once you're up at several thousand feet, you get atmosphere between you and the subject. So, you know, I'm sure you've flown and just seen it's like a hazy when you look down there. Well, you know, it's, you know, it's not that different. I mean, when you're in a smaller craft and you're a little higher, maybe not as hazy as 30,000 feet, but it's hazy at 1,000 or 2,000 feet. And what I was able to do with digital, which is not possible with the analog process, is I was able to increase the contrast. I was able to actually bring the saturation and contrast up of that kind of hazy landscape. If this was shot in film, I can assure you it wouldn't be as interesting as an image as, I, as, as what is possible with um, Photoshop. So, but color, I'm always trying to bring it back to what I feel is, is what the color I, I felt was there or close to what was there. Uh, but the contrast is where I, do, I take liberties and start to bring in contrast that wasn't present in the scene to kind of give the print a, a more of a presence and vibrancy as you stand in front of it and look at it. So, um, but otherwise, I don't use fo Photoshop as a compositional tool. I don't use it to create the image. I use it as uh, Photoshop as a printmaking tool. So the color, the density, contrast control, those are the things I control. You know, if there is something in the bottom corner, like um, you know, a white you know coffee cup or something like that, I don't like it. Well, I would have I would have got rid of it anyways in the analog way. I would have got a retoucher to retouch it out. Uh, in this case, I just need the rubber stamp to get rid of it. So I'll, I'll I'll take those kinds of small liberties when there's something in the in the frame that's distracting and not bringing anything into the picture. I might you know delete it, but I don't kind of create, I don't put people into the scene, I don't create the scene, I, I let that still occur in the real world. So I'm still dedicated to making images of our world. Excellent. One more question? Yes? Um, well, the, uh, there is one, uh, I, there's a gentleman by the name of Wade Davis, uh, who's a, a friend of mine, and I met him back in 2006 at a TED conference. And then about two years ago, he spoke at TED. He was given you know five minutes to speak, and he and he spoke about the uh, the sacred headwaters of uh, of northern BC, which they're known as. It's uh, Taltan Nation uh, is is uh, is there, and he refers to this as our kind of our Amazon, our, our kind of great untouched landscape uh, and, and uh, every, every, every bit as, as important and critical to, to, um, 
you know, to nature and to the uh, to to a pure watershed. One of the last, there's no dams in this watershed, so it is the last Canadian kind of pure play on. on it's just underneath the border of uh, of Alaska. It's about you know two or three hundred uh, kilometers south of Alaska. So uh, I wanted to kind of end the film at source, that uh, at this idea of source and. Uh, when I saw what Wade was doing and how he's you know, leading a charge to try to preserve this uh, watershed from uh, being uh, mined, or, or you know, right, there was a proposal by Shell to um, to be able to frack for gas in there, and he he managed to stop that. Actually, at that TED conference, the president of Shell was there, and he said, "I don't, we're, we don't want to go where we don't want to, you know, where we're not wanted." So they stopped, they shelved that project. But uh, now there's a bunch of mining projects. So I was working with Wade um, uh, to, you know, with this idea of, the, of a pristine watershed and, 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 and showing it uh, in the film and in my, in my book as well. So that's how I ended up uh, in northern BC. It's, it's Wade's, uh, Wade's uh, amazing work on that, uh, on trying to preserve uh, that last phenomenal watershed. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Ed.